I thought I'd do a quick video today on some of the optimizations I've had to make in order to fit the circuits for the transistor processor onto the boards. Now, the observant of you will have probably noticed by now that the boards are the uh, width and, and form factor of the Altair 8800 boards. In fact, they use the same motherboard, and the reason I chose to do that is because I have already created um, replica motherboards for the Altair. So I had quite a few knocking around and um, didn't see the need to create a new design of motherboard when I already had one that would work. The problem in doing that is, of course, uh, it limits the size of the, the board. I can't make them any wider, they wouldn't fit on the motherboard, so I have ended up making them a little bit taller. Uh, they're about 20 millimeters taller than the Altair boards, and I decided to stick to that size board as much as possible during the design, but it has meant that certain circuits would not have fitted onto the board if I hadn't optimized them to a, a fairly large degree. Now, now one, one of the most complex circuits in the processor is actually the program counter, and that occupies this area of the board. This is the clock board. This is the clock board. It doesn't look particularly large in its current form, but the optimizations saved about 60 transistors from the design that would have been required had I not done that. So I'll quickly run through what the optimizations were. There are a few in other parts of the processor, but as much as possible I kept it in line with the, uh, the breadboard version that I made, just so that anyone that's read the book would be familiar with the circuits without having to look back at every single circuit and decide where the changes were. So the main reason for needing to change the design of the program counter are because in the original design, the processor did not support jumps at all, either simple jumps or conditional jumps. The program counter just counted starting at zero, counting up until it got to either a halt instruction where it stopped or until it was reset back to zero or until it wrapped around back to zero. In this version, it will do the same thing. It will start at zero and count up it will wrap around when it gets to um, the maximum count. It can be cleared, but it can also be loaded with any value we want from the data bus. Now, those requirements make it significantly more complicated than the simple program counter that was in the original processor. So I'll go over what the circuit is, how it works, but also how it was optimized in order to fit it onto the board. As you can see, there just isn't room for another 60 transistors, so in its um, original form it would not have fitted onto this board, and I've had to have made all the boards bigger in order to accommodate it. So we'll start off by looking at the general circuits that we require for this. It's uh, not a ring counter, it's just a, a binary counter. So bit 0 on the left here, bit 1, bit 2, bit 3. Ignore the bottom bit for now, the counter is just the top part. These gates are to carry across and increment the subsequent bits at the right time. Um, but essentially, it's just a simple counter using JK flip-flops. And the form that the flip-flops are used in is just their toggling form where the J and the K are tied together, which means that on each clock pulse, they will just toggle the output. Now, it's a synchronous counter. The, all the bits are clocked at the same time, and we need that in order to be able to have the processor work reliably. We don't want the count rippling through, it has to be synchronous where all the bits are updated at the same time and the bits appear out from the Q outputs. We don't use the inverted Qs uh, at all in this design. Notice down here we have the, the clears. Clears rather uh, an inaccurate description for the pin. What it does is sets the Q to, to a value of 1 but it's not really clearing it, it's just setting the queue to a value of 1. Whether that's clear or not depends on the usage of the flip-flop. If you decide that you want to use it for another purpose, then the clear might be a load. And at the top we have um, the, the, the load pin, and that works in a similar way to the clear, except that uh, it sets the queue to a zero. So the, you can look at them both in terms of being clears, but one clears to high, one clears to low. Uh, but that means that uh, when you think about it, you can actually use them to preload the values in the flip-flops. All you need to do is make sure you have the right 0, 1 
on the uh, on the clear and the the preset when you next um, have a clock pulse and that way it will load the correct value into the counter or at least into each bit of the counter uh, the way we have this circuit arranged we're loading all the bits at once and we're loading them from the data values down here now this is where it starts getting more complicated compared to the original design so essentially the way this works is we feed data into the um, the gate at the bottom there's an inverter between the first NAND gate and the second which means that when this one's high this one's low and vice versa that in turn is gated so we have this signal coming through here you can kind of forget about the inverter for now that's just to make the logic work in the rest of the machine but this line controls the gating of the data in through each of the NAND gates. So in other words, when we toggle this line, as when this line goes high, we effectively enable the output and these just become inverters. And that's an important point when we get back to the optimization. These really are used as inverters that we can enable or disable. The rest of this is just to make sure that we can determine what values we are latching into the, um, the flip-flop. Also notice that this line is common across all the, the bits. That's all the loads are controlled through a single line. The only thing that's different, of course, is the, the inputs are connected to different data lines. So if we take this as a starting point and then we look at the circuit that we use for the itself. So this circuit is, is actually just this element, it's just one of these. Luckily, it's only a four-bit counter, so we only need four of each of these circuits. But even so, it's it's quite, uh, or it becomes quite a significant sized circuit when we get to the transistor version. So if we go from this circuit, we look at the flip-flop itself. Firstly, we only need the single-stage flip-flop. We don't need the master-slave. Again, that saved us uh, a lot of space. The only thing that adds to this is that we need the load function at the top. If you look at the rest of the flip-flops that we use throughout the processor, most of them have the reset or the clear, but this is the only one that we use that has the load as well. So effectively, as you can see, it's kind of a, a mirror image. And all we're doing is we're either clearing to a high output or clearing to a low input, a low output. Clock comes in on the left. To make it a JK flip-flop as opposed to just a simple uh, D type flip-flop all we need to do is add an inverter and a second input to the lower uh, gate. So this is a JK flip-flop with load and, and reset. If we then look at the next sheet we have to add the next elements to this. So we've got the flip-flop at the top um, but we need this load part at the bottom, so the, the circuit we're going to look at now is effectively this bit. So as you can see, it's identical. We've got the flip-flop at the top. We've got the clear and load lines going in, and then we've got the gating logic at the bottom that allows us to determine when to clear and load. Bear in mind, this, this um, latch will only actually latch when the, the clock signal is um, is high. Because the flip-flops are used in their toggling mode, the first one, the first flip-flop in the chain, just has a, a value of 1 applied to the input. And what will happen there is the output will just toggle between a 1 and a 0 each time there is a clock pulse. And that, and the output is then um, t uh, taken through and carried through the rest of the bits uh, in such a way that it counts up in binary. But the actual load feature and load function is the same for all the bits. So again, we notice we've got a common load line here, and this line will actually carry on through to the rest of the bits in the counter. We then go ahead and look at the transistor equivalent of the the flip-flop so this is not the entire circuit this is just this part of it so if we look at the transistor version of this what we end up with is this 
if you've read the book, you'll have seen this before. It's just the, the JK version flip flop. The only thing again that's different is it has the load feature included. So rather than there being a two uh, input gate here, there's a three input. And that gives us the ability to load whatever value we want into the flip flop. But now we need to add the, the gating logic that allows us to do the actual loading. And that's what uh, this element down here is. So if we look back at the original schematic, this lower section um, is actually just this. Um, but it does include the inverter. So all we've got is a two input NOR gate here, two input NOR gate here. We feed data in to one of the inputs. We have an inverter feeding data into one of the other inputs. And then we have the two outputs, one going to clear or reset and the other one going up to the uh, load function uh, at the top. Um, this is the input inverter that takes us from the low logic uh, control signal to the um, high level required to gate the, uh, the, the null gates. So as you can see, it's getting quite complicated already and there is well, there are yet more elements that we need to add to it. So the next one is we need to be able to clear the, um, the flip-flop or, or the counter. Now you could say, well, what, you just loaded a zero value into it. Well, when you clear the processor or reset the processor, nothing, you're not running code. So it needs to have an explicit clear function. And so to do that, it's just a simple case of adding a, uh, another gate to respond to a low level clear and to give us a an override, if you like, to the clear function here. And this is where you've got to be careful with a design like this. Because we are potentially loading and clearing at the same time, if you were to try to clear while you're trying to set a, a, a zero value on the preset, you'd have a kind of a, a conflict where it was trying to set a one and a zero on the queue at the same time. You've got to remember that when this circuit's being used, it's working within the processor, which means that when a, a clear is asserted, all the other lines being fed into this will be in their clear state. That includes the data in. So when the, the processor is cleared, data in will be zero, uh, or at least not driven. The clock will be low because it will be also set to, um, to clear. And any inputs to the the system that are driven through the control matrix will also be in their inactive state. So in other words, when you assert a clear, you can be fairly sure that you have control in effect through the clear line of the counter and you're not going to be in conflict with anything else. As long as you remember that that is by virtue of all the rest of the circuits in the processor being in their reset state. Okay, so when we get that part working, there's one more element that we need um, before we have the fully working program counter. Remember, this is just one bit of the program counter. And the last part is uh, we need to be able to gate the outputs onto the data bus. So we have data coming in to the uh, counter when we load it, but we also need to be able to gate the current value of the counter out onto the data bus. So what we have here is what amounts to a tri-state register. And again, this has been optimized compared to the standard one that we use in the rest of the processor. The tri-state buffers normally have five transistors, but this has been optimized for just three. Now, all these changes together save us quite a few transistors. The current state that this is in, there's over 45 transistors in each bit of the program counter. And that was just far too many. It wasn't going to fit onto the the board. So it was a case of optimizing the program counter. And this is the optimized circuit. This is all four bits. If we look at just one. Now, if we look at this circuit, then what becomes fairly obvious is, and as I mentioned earlier, is that these really just act as inverters. So you get data coming in through an inverter and feeding into the uh, load or reset and all that the PL line does is it enables the inverter. Now if it enables the inverter and we have what amounts to pull-ups on the output of the 
two control lines, that's both the reset and the low, when they're in their inactive state, it will be pulled high through these two resistors. Now, that essentially means that when they're not being used, you can discount everything below uh, this line. So whatever is happening below this line when they're in their default state uh, doesn't do anything. So you can then simplify this by removing the additional components in each particular or each individual bit and replacing it with a single instance of a control line. And that's the way that this works. So if we look at it, we have an inverter, which is this inverter. We have another one here, which is this one. Sorry, this one. Uh, and then we have an inverter between the two, which is this one. That's this. And what we end up with is exactly the same circuit, but we then have combined these two. So these two second inputs through an inverter are combined. So that becomes this. So this single line replaces that transistor, that transistor, but it does the same thing for every single bit in the counter. So this line carries on to the other stages and that is this line. And as you can see in this diagram, it feeds all the stages and the same with the clear. So rather than having a separate clear for every single line, a separate inverter for every single clear, we have a common clear. And again, that feeds all four bits together. And that means that you save a number of transistors on the load function and a number of transistors on the clear function. It makes a circuit a bit unusual when you try to understand what's going on, but essentially all that happens is when this transistor turns off, that is when uh, we disable the latch or rather disable the load function, then these, this line and this line float as do the rest of them because they're all on the same control line. And that means that we're not loading anything. It also means because these are floating, we can override that state with a common clear function. So in other words, this clear function will override whatever else is going on and pull this line low. And because that is effectively a low level clear signal, that will clear the, uh, the um, flip flop or at least set the Q output to a zero, which is what we deem to be a clear. So once you've done that, you end up with the overall circuit that looks like this. Still looks quite complicated, but without the optimization that we've made, there'd be around another 40 or so uh, transistors in the counter uh, and several more in the control logic and more still in the uh, tri-state buffers. These bits here are the, um, the AND gates that sit between the um, third and fourth bits. Okay, so I don't know if you found that interesting or not, but um, there were quite a few of that type of optimizations made throughout the design of the processor. Coincidentally, I was talking to a friend today and uh, he was saying how much neater the design of the, uh, the PCBs were for the kit than the original breadboard version. Um, but he was referring to the breadboard version that you've probably seen if you've watched my other videos and that was a tidied up breadboard. And I'm sure that any of you that have done a lot of work with breadboards realize they very quickly get very messy. And in fact, this is the prototype breadboard version of two of the bits for the program counter, not including the tri-state buffers. So as you can see, they do get extremely messy very quickly. And if you were to expand this into a full processor, you can imagine the size and the, uh, the amount of wires that would be sticking out of it everywhere. Okay, so I hope you found that interesting. It's um, one of those things that sometimes you need to do when you're limited on space on the boards, but also it makes it far less tedious to, to assemble. And um, if you would like me to go over any other particular elements of the design, then please um, put it in the comments below and I'll try to make a video about it. Um, otherwise, I will be posting more videos about various aspects of the design and then ultimately we'll, we'll have some videos on, on using it and running some more complex software.